Good morning. Shalom, everybody. Thank you for joining me today. And Jacob, let me just add him to the spotlight so you can all see him. Uh, so thank you for joining us this morning. We're going to visit some exciting countries today um, in the in Jewish communities in the Southern Mediterranean with our expert tour guide, tour guide Jacob Shushan. Jerusalem-born Jacob is a licensed tour guide in Israel, as well as a teacher and lecturer at the Tour Guide College in Israel. Shushan has visited 98 countries and led tours in 65 countries and all six continents, which is pretty impressive. Um, Jacob is fluent in 15 languages. He presents in-depth discussion on Jewish history, philosophy, and culture, and is deeply involved in Holocaust education. We are thrilled to have Jacob here with us today uh, once again. And I really hope that you all going to enjoy this tour. And Jacob, I can just uh, let you begin. With pleasure. Will you please take over from me and admit everybody? Sure. Who joins now? Hi, everybody. Shalom and welcome. Wonderful to see you guys again and looking forward to traveling with you through yet another very different and unusual kind of destination. Can everybody see the screen? Can everybody see the first slide? Oh, okay. So we will go to visit, as you see, Libya, Tunisia, and Malta. Where are we? We are in the Southern Mediterranean, the Northern part of Africa on a different visit we toured Morocco, God willing, one day we will visit Egypt together again. Number one destination as far as I'm concerned, no matter how you look at it. But today we'll do Libya, Tunisia, and tiny little Malta, just next to Sicily. Here we have these uh, countries highlighted on the map. And Libya, of course, is a huge, huge country. Tunisia, much smaller, and Malta is a tiny little piece of nothing. No direct flights, so you really have to schlep to connect maybe a couple times to get to that destination. Look at the size of Libya. Such a huge country with a very small population, even smaller than Israel. 70 odd years ago, 38,000 Jews, and as you see today, absolutely none, not a single one. We have a very special and deep connection to this place. Marcus Aurelius is one of the significant Roman uh, figures in our history. And we toured the city which was built during the Roman time. Unfortunately, during the war, the last events that took place there, the city has been totally, totally devastated as you can see. The city is in ruins and they took them a long time to clear the rubble and gradually, gradually they are rebuilding themselves and bringing it back to the city it used to be. The city had all the money, the country had all the money in the world because of the oil reserves. Of course, it was abused and not used in the right way, but now they are working uh, on it and it's going to be much better featuring modern architecture, traditional Muslim architecture. Uh, now it is a very clean place and people will hold on to their heritage. You know, they had only one king, this King Idris. And uh, when he was deposed, when Gaddafi made the, took the power, when he did the, like a coup, uh, lots of people still reminiscence and still uh, long for that uh, time. And we will visit now some of the sites in this town, beautifully lit, beautifully decorated. And we are going to discover some magnificent mosaic floors on this trip, both in Libya and in Tunisia. And they're absolutely stunning. The museum houses magnificent Roman items between the marble sculptures and statues and some more and more beautiful, beautiful mosaics with stories from mythology and history. And this was a major town with a beautiful library that they used to have here back in the Roman time. I love all these details, all these architectonic details. 
these shrines and sanctuaries, these beautiful temples with the statues. I'm not bothering you with the details, but I think it can show itself. Look at the beautiful clock tower. This is already much later. This is from the beginning of the 20th century when the country was ruled by the Ottoman Empire. It was typical of the Ottoman emperors to build this kind of clock towers. We go into the desert. Most of the country is a desert. Only along the northern shores of the, uh, the northern part of the country, along the shores of the Mediterranean, do people live. Very few uh, communities in the desert, but the desert does provide us with some magnificent landscape. Some of it looks like really lunar because of the volcanic activities that have created this, uh, this uh, terrain. Look at that desert. In the desert, lots of hiking, lots of archaeologists have discovered some of the oldest wall paintings dating back to 20,000 years ago. Who knew that there were people 20,000 years ago who could paint? Of course, we found them later on in other locations, even older in Spain, in France. But these are absolutely fascinating. They were able to perceive the shape of the animals and somebody had the talent to describe them for us, whether it's hunting scene or uh, shepherds following their animals. And another typical thing of this desert, we are in the Sahara Desert, are the oases. An amazing, amazing story of the oases. Some of them have like lakes inside, and some of them have some vegetation growing, and some of them have enough water for communities to settle. You schlep for days through the desert and all of a sudden you come to these communities which somehow managed to survive. The Romans were not the first one to leave stuff here. The Greeks were even before them and we have some Greek temples, the beautiful theaters and the libraries. And we can explore for days on some of the most beautiful ruins, some of the most exciting archaeology. Look at the survival of this theater, not just the theater, the seats, the Scanyon and Pros Canyon. Can you imagine three stories high backstage from which they would have the Deus Ex Machina, you know, how they had people coming down with ropes and how they would imitate all kinds of celestial, heavenly events in the theater. You will come from the United States of America. You might recall that the first war fought by the US Army outside the United States was right here. 200 years ago, there were a few Barbary Wars. They would kidnap American sailors and merchants and ask for ransom. And after a while, when one day they had to pay like $1 million, which was at that time almost a sixth of the national budget of the United States. They said enough is enough and they sent the troops. So that's a very significant story. A major battle took place here where the frigate uh, Philadelphia was set on fire so they will not be able to use it. And Lord Nelson uh, said that that was one of the most heroic battles fought anywhere. They sneaked into the ship to, just to set it on fire. And the battle that took place fighting against the locals was uh, really, really something very special in American history. I don't recall hearing much about it visiting the United States and being there, but no question, it has been uh, something very, very special in history. So you see the location of the towns and townships with very few further down south. Most of them are along the shores of the Mediterranean. Uh, Jews have first been in touch with this uh, place probably some 2,300 years ago. You see the image of Alexander the Great, the guy who created this large empire. After his death, his successor, Ptolemy, uh, was able to uh, create a kingdom here, kind of an extension, Egypt, which also included these parts of Libya. And that's when Jews came for the first time. 
this is a synagogue today in Israel, which is supposed to be a spitting image of the synagogue in Libya, which is not used, of course, any longer. But they had the pictures, they had the plans, and people remembered, and they built in Israel an identical synagogue in the name of a very special lady, a legendary lady, Bushayev. She was like a spiritual and community leader. She didn't have any children, but she was an outstanding figure. So the synagogue was dedicated to her. Between Tripoli and Benghazi, two major towns where we talk about Jewish communities. Of course, there were many more Jewish communities in other locations. And here we see some pictures taken from the first part of the 20th century. We have a beautiful ketubah, handwritten ketubah. We have here a collection of sages studying in the courtyard of the synagogue. We have the children studying at school. Look at them, all of them wrapped with the talit. And this is the Jewish quarter. The Jewish quarter, as we have seen in other countries, when we visited Morocco, you would remember, there were always two Jewish neighborhoods for the wealthier ones and the ones who were not that comfortable. And they had synagogues in both. Some of them were more ornate, some of them were more humble, more simple. But all of these people practiced Judaism to the letter. Another very special practice at the gate of the cemetery where the weeping ladies, there was never a funeral without these uh, ladies and many of them, that's how they made a living. They developed special skills in, you know, giving these uh, wails and um, weep and cry and what have you. And that's how they made a living and it was an inseparable part of a Jewish funeral. Jews who came from Libya were telling us about something that they love to drink very much. This is a fermented beverage they uh, drink from the sap emitted by the palm. So look at the guy. This was typical Jewish occupation because the, once the juice is being fermented, it's alcoholic and the Muslim will not drink it. So the Jewish people, they would climb up the tree. They will create a cut in the trunk, they will attach the jar to it, and after some days, they will go up, remove it, and let it uh, ferment. Look at this beautiful choir uh, in the school, and look at the Jewish school. They had the whole network of Jewish schools, and when Zionism came about in the beginning of the 20th century, lots of Zionist activities. Look at the traditional dresses and outfits of the Jewish ladies, but everything came to a halt in 1938. You know that from the early years of the 20th century, Italy took over, and when racial laws were introduced in uh, Italy, they were introduced to Libya as well. You see, uh, the laws that uh, relate to the Hebrews, Hebreo, right? To, to the Jews, look at the, how clearly they displayed it. So the Jews cannot serve in the army, the Jews cannot teach, they cannot be owners of businesses that cater to the nation, they cannot own land, they cannot be, uh, they cannot use non-Jews as a domestic servants and so on and so on. This is 1938. If that was not bad enough, later on during the war, thousands of Jews were sent to labor camps. They were arrested, disconnected, separated from their families, and sent to labor camps. The most famous one was in Jadu. Unfortunately, we do not have too many pictures. They didn't take any pictures at the time, but this is what's left of this place, which employed thousands of Jews. They were quarrying the stone from the mountains, they were paving roads, and some of them were sent even to Europe. Can you imagine from the deserts of Libya? This is in a transit station in Italy. They were shipped from here by train, and they ended up in Bergen-Belsen. Can you imagine hundreds of Jews from Libya? We don't necessarily associate, right, the Holocaust with North Africa, but they were 
from Libya, from Tunisia, from Algeria. We mentioned it when we were in Morocco. And this is how living conditions, of course, were there. And after liberation, look at the inscription on the train car, going home to Tripoli, right? So that was something uh, special for them to come back to. While the British took over and liberated, all these young Jewish girls were busy washing the clothes, the uniform of the British soldiers. That's a very unusual picture. Lots of books were written about it. You can read the title in Hebrew, Benghazi to Bergen-Belsen. Uh, quite a lot of very interesting stories that somehow, for whatever reason, were kind of hushed in my view. They were not made known like we know so much about Jews from other European countries, but we don't know much about the plight of these people. And here are them welcoming the uh, British. And then when they got independence, this became the king, Idris on the left, and until Muammar Gaddafi took over. <laughs> Another synagogue that was severely damaged, but still. Jews were there, they left and they trusted the synagogue to these Arab gentlemen, these Libyan gentlemen who's been taking care of the synagogue ever since. In Tripoli, they had like a whole courtyard with quite a few synagogues, bigger and smaller ones. And the Jewish cemetery, unfortunately, totally, totally devastated. These pictures were taken recently by a journalist to travel there. Israelis cannot go there really, but people with a foreign passport traveled there and came back and gave us these stories. This is the ancient village of Yefran, which was home to a very sizable Jewish community. We commemorate the victims of the Holocaust in many places in Israel. Netanya, which has a very large concentration of Libyan Jews, has built a very prominent memorial uh, to commemorate them. They are also commemorated, if you have been to Jerusalem, into Yad Vashem, you must have visited the Valley of the Fallen Communities. So a whole section is dedicated to the victims of um, the Jews from Libya during the Holocaust. We move on to the next town, a smaller town, but very, very exciting, very rich, uh, for the tourists, smaller area, twice as much the population, and still home to anywhere from a thousand, maybe two thousand, maybe sometimes twenty five hundred. Why is it? Like we said when we were in Morocco, many of them have dual and triple citizenship. They come and go, but I would like to believe that at any time there are at least fifteen hundred Jews in Tunisia. This is the map of Tunisia. You see that they come from the shore up to the mountains. Some of the mountains are even covered with snow, very high altitude. And look at the map of the Jewish communities. Again, most of them are along the shore, but some of them are indoors inside the country, especially interesting is Cairo one uh, that we'll talk about later on. I'm taking you now to Lebanon. Why on earth would I do that? because thousands of years ago, that was home to a very interesting nation, the Phoenician nation, and they were seafarers. And we have reason to believe that Jews joined them on their travel. Here in Biblos, we have some names that would remind us of Hebrew Saudi names, Achiram, an incredible sarcophagus uh, with interesting paintings. Look at the dancers, look at the king at his uh, throne. And these Phoenicians have set shop all the way around the Mediterranean. They reach Spain. They have founded colonies on the Balearic Islands in Ibiza, Mallorca, uh, Minorca, in Sardinia, in Sicily. Look at that. They came to Crete all the way around the Mediterranean. And along with the Phoenicians, came the Jews. They set sail in these sailboats and they developed later on merchant lines and traded through these colonies with many other parts of the continent. Look at their height, how huge their empire was stretching from Egypt 
through Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, Spain, all the way up to uh, Sardinia and even Corsica and parts of Sicily. If we look at the reconstruction of what the city would have looked like at the time, a big busy harbor in Benghazi, look at the Roman town with the different features and the harbor, the walled city, and still lots of uh, stuff left around. This is the town of Tunis. And the town of Tunis is home to yet another mighty empire that, er that evolved from the Phoenicians. And obviously I'm talking about the Carthaginians, Carthage. So this is where the capital of Carthage used to be. Unfortunately, you remember the Punic War, the Romans came time and time again. They won some, they lost some. Hannibal, the king of Carthage has defeated them. Then they defeated, and once they defeated after the third Punic War, they have destroyed everything almost completely. Very little is left out of the Carthaginian uh, towns and villages, but luckily lots of the rubble fell on the floor and it was hiding these gorgeous, gorgeous mosaic floors. Maybe some of the most beautiful mosaic floors in the world. I know that's a very assuming uh, assumption. It's a very daring assumption, but I think some of the most beautiful mosaic floors anywhere in the world are to be found in Carthago, in Tunisia, where the capital of the Carthaginian used to be. Look at the shade, look at the depth the perspective, the images, the, the, the color combination. My goodness, it's so beautiful. As well as lots of statues managed somehow to survive and they are prominently displayed nowadays in the museum in the town of Tunis. The town of Tunis is the capital of Tunisia. It is a beautiful city, very welcoming city, a major tourist destination, millions of tourists used to come there before the Arab Spring and hundreds of thousands are returning there now that the situation is much better. They had a very significant uh, tile industry in this country, especially in the town of Nabel, but not only. So you're gonna walk in the markets and you're gonna see lots of stuff being displayed and not least will be the gorgeous ceramic tiles and other features that were used here over the years. Look at the street in the narrow lanes of the residential neighborhoods. Everything is whitewashed with beautiful blue color, and we can see it in many, many different locations all over. These are the tiles from Nabel. That is like a tradition. Many families, each family does a couple dozen of the patterns in which they specialize and people who live there, they know, oh, that's this family, that's that family. And the combination of the tiles really make a beautiful, beautiful display. Now I'd like to talk about another story that might have to do with the Jews, we'll never find out. This was Al-Kahina. She was the one who, fought bitterly and led the Berber tribes to war. And we don't know if she existed. We don't know much about her. She comes in different names, but there are lots of suggestions saying that she was from a Jewish tribe that has converted to Judaism after being Berbers for the longest time. You know, we today make conversions so difficult for non-Jews, right? It, especially in Israel, you have to be converted halachically according to orthodoxy. But between the second century BCE, during the Hasmonean time, until the big uprisings in the Bar Kokhba time, in the second century of the common era, there was big conversion activity. Lots of Jews have converted, lots of people have converted to Judaism. Among them, we have good reason to believe we know Lots of tribes in North Africa. So Al-Kahina, who is a legendary hero, could have been a descendant from that tribe. The Berbers are the original dwellers of this region. The Arabs came only in the seventh century, but the original inhabitants were the Berbers and they still are there with their outfit, with their language, with their, you can tell facial features are very different than the Arab ones. 
with their traditions in farming and whatever. Look at this amazing outfit of the older Berber ladies. This is like a modern uh, display of their traditional outfit. They have their own calendar. So now they celebrate uh, the year 2,900 and something because they uh, count differently and they have different months. And you see how they celebrate now a much later year and their calendar, which they use, display the different uh, Muslim calendar, the general Julian calendar and their own calendar. Also here, we have a story about a synagogue that was uh, rebuilt in Israel to be a spitting image, but this is the one that they have returned and renovated it. They renovated it to look like it did originally. We move on to the different towns in the desert. We go to Kerawan. Kerawan was home to a very special group of uh, people. There were somehow a big concentration of Jewish scholars to the point that one of the streets in downtown Tel Aviv in a very prominent upscale neighborhood is called Chachmei Kerawan, the wise men of Kerawan. Look at the beautiful mosque, look at the towers and the citadel, the minarets, and this uh, is a stamp uh, from Tunisia, but it is published on a postcard showing a Jewish money changer. This is a Jewish money changer. The Jews of Tunisia have a special tradition. During Simchat Torah, not only do they take the Torah cases out of the Holy Ark, out of Aron Kodesh, but they dress it with beautiful fabrics and, and uh, like um, shawls and kerchiefs, and they leave it for 10 days. They don't return it into Aron Kodesh, into the Holy Ark for 10 days. We found some very ancient uh, mosaics in this area where we have the menorah. So that's an indication to the existence of Jewish people. This happens to be in a house from the third century of the coming era. So you can just imagine. Uh, we can see again uh, some of the uh, prominently displayed Jewish towns. Here is Sus. Kirawan, Sfax, Gabes, but I'd like to take you here to this tiny little island, which is the focal point of Jewish life today in this country, the island of Jerba. The island of Jerba was home to Jewish people according to their own tradition, at least for 2,500 years. They believe they gathered during the exile, the expulsion after the destruction of the first temple, and they have set shop and existed in their communities. Uh, the synagogue in this place, I'm going to send you the entire uh, presentation. Try to run this movie, try to run this video, because I think it will be very interesting for you to watch. Anyhow, this is a major holiday destination. Thousands and thousands of Jews used to, and now again, after things became easier, come there for holidays. Whether they were originally from there or not, both from Israel, mostly from France and other places where Tunisian Jews immigrated to, and uh, lots of millions of uh, non-Jews, lots of European people come there to escape the harsh winters in Europe. This is Southern Mediterranean, it's warm and lovely. And uh, here we have a commemoration to a very uh, special person, Rabbi Matzliach uh, Mazuz, uh, somebody who was uh, assassinated uh, in Israel after moving to Israel from Jerba during one of the terror attacks and he is being prominently commemorated. Look at the synagogue, it's so beautiful. And this picture is taken now because there are special two major holidays where they go on what they call Hilula. They have like a big pilgrimage to this place with a special feast with singing and dancing 
And look at these elderly gentlemen, elderly gentlemen holding on to the Zohar, be studying Kabbalah. Look at the Yarmulka on the head of these gentlemen, Al Gariba. There are two Jewish neighborhoods, Har al Kbirao, Har al Zrira, and the big synagogue Al Gariba means the central focal point. Somehow, in a strange fate, when Israel couldn't tolerate anymore the incursion of PLO from Lebanon, we went on the big operation there in 82, 1982, and the Arafat and the PLO moved from uh, Lebanon to Tunisia, and they settled there. That was a sad, sad moment for us, as was another sad moment uh, years earlier when uh, France, which took over North Africa, as you see already in the 1830s, but comes World War II, and the gentleman on the left, Maréchal Pétain, who was a world hero, during World War I, he was a war hero, most admired by the French, somehow allied with Hitler, and France was divided between occupied France by Germany and by Italy, and what they call the Free France, the Vichy France. But the Vichy France also controls these areas, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, while Italy controls Libya. So now again, the fate of the Jews is not too great. Thousands of Jews were taken into the concentration camps. Try to look up this movie. Uh, Victor Young Peretz. He was a boxer. He was a flyweight boxer, but the Germans made him um, compete and box with some heavyweight guys, and he beat them all. So he was given a chance to get some more food, which he made sure to split and share with his friends in the camp. When the camp was liberated, uh, they took them on the march of death, and he was able to have some bread and food with him, which he wanted to distribute. And the German soldier said, don't leave the line. He said, I'm only giving food to my friend. And he shot him dead at a very young age. You can see how young he was, an incredible hero, Victor Peretz. Jews were taken to labor camps. Look at them. These were merchants. Doctors, lawyers, engineers, architects, what have you, they were given a shovel and sent to work. So that was something that was done also in a way to humiliate them. They couldn't carry much with them, just a small package and taken the shovel and sent. The people who went to the labor camps were forced to wear a yellow sign. It was not really a Star of David. That's the only one we have in Yad Vashem, but we know about it from, of course, witnesses and people who told us about it. Can you imagine the Star of David being worn in Tunisia? At one point, you remember, Hitler changed the taste, so now forget about Vichy. So now the Germans take over and the Germans show up in Tunisia. Rommel is leading from both directions, they want to block the British from being able to wrest supplies from Egypt. The only way to wrest supplies would be from Egypt, which means they had to travel all the way around Africa and come through the Suez Canal. And that is uh, some incredible story under the Nazi occupation. Of course, things were tougher and tougher all the times until you had the Tunisian operation where Americans, British, Indian soldiers in the British army, Polish soldiers who joined the Allied uh, teamed up and conducted a major, major campaign. Uh, here is uh, Eisenhower talking to General Alexander. And finally, the Americans and the British were able to win. And we see a triumphant entrance of the Allied forces into Tunisia. Uh, those of you who traveled with us many months ago in Israel, you might have joined us when we visited a Tunisian Jewish synagogue in the town of Akko in Israel. If you haven't, please make sure to visit it on your next visit. It's a masterpiece of mosaic work, and make sure to visit it on your next trip to Israel. Adi, may I share with them the story that we are going to visit it in October? May I share it? 
in the next few days, Adi is going to send everybody, BZD is going to send you the information about the tour we were planning to hold and we had to postpone it from March to October, but finally it looks like we're going to be able to travel. So this synagogue is also featured on our itinerary with beautiful, beautiful stained glass windows, the masterpiece of uh, of uh, mosaics, not only on the walls, but on the ceiling, on the floors, everywhere throughout. We concluded our visit to Tunisia and we would like to move over to Malta. So this is called the Sicily Canal. We're only 50 miles from Italy, but we come to a very different country. Look at the size of the country. It is just 122 square miles. It's a tiny little piece of nothing with a little over 500,000 people living there. But it is an exciting place. Jews used to be thousands of them. We'll hear about the different periods here. Jews had to suffer from various periods of persecution and dispersation and, and uh, dispersion and expulsions and what have you. It is an archipelago of islands, a couple dozen, but people live only on the two big islands, on Malta and Gozo. And on the Comino Island, there is just a hotel, but it's a very interesting Jewish story. A rabbi came in the Middle Ages in the 13th century, and he thought to solve the problem of the Jews in the world by convincing the Catholic Pope to convert to Judaism, which of course did not happen and he was kicked away and he ended up on this island of Comino. People have lived here from the Stone Age. We found some huge megalithic shrines and sanctuaries. And the town itself is one of the most colorful, most exciting, most inviting towns. This is the town of Valletta, the capital of Malta and predominantly featuring the big uh, cathedral, some other shrines, and the whole place is surrounded by the wall. And wherever you look, you're going to look into the sea and lots of activities between fishermen and sailing and navigating a beautiful, beautiful town. Uh, another major, major holiday destination. And until COVID-19, believe it or not, we had direct flights from Israel to come here. Thousands and thousands of Israel came to visit, along with millions of tourists from all over the world, 500,000, but they accommodate millions of tourists. And it's only two hours and a half from Israel, very, very short distance. The town has lots of attractions and I'm fascinated particularly by taking a walk in the old town with the narrow lanes, that have all kinds of interesting architectonic style from various periods. Look at these colorful balconies. I'm fascinated by them. And from many directions, you see the sea. You look left, you look right, you'll end up by the sea. Look at this combination. Uh, they have uh, one of the oldest theaters in the world, the third oldest theater, of course, now made into a modern building. So between the town and if you go to the countryside, you're going to discover some magnificent vistas, people who like to dive or snorkel. This was a very typical Jewish occupation. Salt. Now we think salt is like, I think, the cheapest item you can get in the supermarket. But thousands of years ago, until a few hundred years ago, salt was a very special commodity, not to salt your food, but to preserve your fish and meat in the absence of refrigerator. Jews were in the salt business, especially trading and selling salt. Look at the various places. I think many of you would associate Malta with the movie, The Maltese Falcon, uh, with Humphrey Bogart, Mary Astor, Peter Lorre. Uh, again, you look too young, but you might have seen these uh, movie or so a rerun, late night rerun of this absolutely fabulous movie. The Maltese falcon is a very special bird and the Spanish king leased Malta 
to a very special order, night's order for one falcon a year. That's what they had to come up with. They couldn't always, so they would kidnap uh, Jews and ask for ransom from the Turkish government and such incredible stories. You know, the Crusaders, the Order of St. John, they were founded in Jerusalem in 1099. And after a while, they were kicked out of Jerusalem in 1186 after the Battle of the Horns of Hittim. They settled in Akko and along the shore in Israel, in Caesarea, Atlit, Dor, until they were kicked out by the Mamelukes in the second part of the 13th century. They moved to Cyprus, to Rhodes. They were kicked out from Rhodes and they ended up here in Malta. And this is the palace of the Grand Master of the uh, Order of St. John. And believe it or not, they still exist. Today, the palace is the palace of the president of Malta. It's an incredible building, very ornate, beautifully decorated. The details, the sculpting, the stone chiseling and carving, absolutely fabulous. This is the coat of arms, which is prominently featured there. This is the reception hall. And this is where they have the meetings. And this is the throne room, used to be the throne of the Grand Master. This is now the place where the president has some official meetings. Very, very beautiful place. One of my favorite parts of the palace is the tapestry room. They have dozens and dozens of authentic Goblin handmade tapestries, specially commissioned for this room. Unreal. Again, if we leave town and we go into the countryside, we'll go first into this uh, fort of St. Angelo. And this is home to one person. He is the last remaining knight of Malta. He took the oath in 1999 and he still lives there. A very decent gentleman, uh, speaks English like, like a Londoner and very pleasant person to have a chat with. And it's like, who knew? Like a fossil, right? Like a remnant from the dinosaurs period. Further into the countryside, we climbed the roof of this castle because it offers us a beautiful view over Malta. The whole place was created as a result of volcanic and tectonic activities. At one point, Tunisia was connected to Italy and then when the Sea of Tethys disappeared and the Mediterranean showed up with lots of activities, it left us with very, very unusual landscape and beautiful places at that. Look at the very dramatic scenery. The Maltese language has its own alphabet. All of a sudden you see letters you don't recognize or combination and the order is different because the language is made out of somehow ancient Phoenician, to whatever extent, Arabic, Italian, English, and some indigenous words. And they even speak it differently from one island to the other. In Malta, they speak a slightly different dialect than they speak in the island of Gozo. It's one country, but very traditional, very traditional. The country, by the way, is so traditional that it was only in 2011 that they allowed, for example, abortions, the last country in Europe to accept abortions. Can you imagine just 11 years ago? So you know how traditional they are. Again, Jewish existence here goes way back. We found here the ancient Roman catacombs. And in the catacombs, we found the, uh, the shape of the menorah, you can see on the upper right side. Here we have a letter sent by the Jewish community asking for help to liberate for ransom. Can you imagine? There was an entire community on the island made out of Jewish slaves. They didn't harm them. They just enslaved them. And they knew that the Jews had contacts and Jews elsewhere will have mercy and will have compassion and redeem them. So here it's an interesting letter sent by the Jews to England to ask for financial help so they can redeem the slaves, a picture of a Jewish family from the turn of the century, and lots of signs that were put up recently, replacing some uh, 
unclear indications, Jews had here a silk market, ancient silk market. This was the Jews' gate. Jews were allowed to come in and out only through this gate. And this is the Jewish tree, trik. Those of you who know a little Arabic, trik like tarik, like Hebrew derech, tal, which means like shell, of lehud, lehud al yahud, the Jews. Very interesting to see how the language has evolved over the years. During the war, Malta was held by the British, so the Germans knew that it is in their way, blocking their passage into North Africa further. So the town was heavily bombarded, but luckily survived. The synagogues, there are a couple synagogues there. Now only one of them functions. And a small Jewish community, 200 people, hardly ever do they have a minion, hardly ever because they have a minion only when the tourists come from Israel, from France, from uh, the United States. Lots of British Jews go to Malta. They love it because also of the language. By the way, as a result of being part of the British Empire for the longest, they still drive on the wrong side of the road. They still drive on the left side in Malta. But the Jews who live here, no matter what, they are very, very strict keeping Judaics. This is the ladies' gallery. And this is the Kiddush room. So if there is a minyan, and even if there isn't, they retire from the main hall to this room to have a Kiddush. This is a very special lady. We owe a lot to this lady. She comes from a very prominent Jewish family. In the 1930s, she was the first woman here to acquire high education. But they kicked her out of school. You know why? Because she wanted to study in biology. She wanted to study Darwin. And the Catholic Church in the 1930s did not believe in evolution here. So they kicked her out of school. But she is the one who preserved and commemorated lots of the items. They lived very comfortable life. Look, this was a gift made by her. This was a decoration in a private Jewish house that was not in a synagogue. Look at this intricate, beautiful masterpiece of Jewish art, and she's the one giving it. Now, we don't really have Jewish education other than kindergarten and some uh, events. Of course, now there is Chabad, so you can imagine Chabad will run Hanukkah, and other festivities. This is as recently as you can see from COVID with the masks. And there is a kosher restaurant. Hardly minion, but everybody eats kosher. And there is a kosher restaurant for the visitors. I really like to encourage people to go to this beautiful island. Even in combination with Israel, two hours, two hours and a half away, it really offers a lot in sense of architecture, art, sheer beauty, beautiful food, gorgeous, gorgeous shrines. Look at the floor of the palace. Look how beautiful the floor is. Look at the walls in the cathedral. It's just mind boggling. And also visiting the ancient uh, ruins to visit the, uh, the temples dating back thousands of years ago. I will not be surprised that Botero, you know, the Colombian artist Botero was inspired by this figure of a lady. She's from 3,200 years ago. Look at the artist. This is not somebody who doesn't know art. This is somebody who wanted to make a certain point, right? Look, he took the liberty. She's so beautiful. Uh, the people there are very Catholic and they celebrate lots of processions, lots of holidays. And after the procession, they sit and they drink and there is music and festivities. Nature there is wild between the temples and shrines and between nature. And you must have seen other than, uh, other than the movie I mentioned, the Fakon, you know, the uh, throne, the House of Throne was filmed here. Do you know that? And Gladiator was filmed here. This is a heaven for filmmakers, and it is featured in many, many, many different productions, TV productions and movies. 
just take a walk in town or go to the countryside, the beautiful shores, Malta is waiting for you. A combination of what used to be a sad Jewish story with a much brighter uh, past few decades. So Malta is definitely a place to consider to go for a visit. Thank you all for visiting us and spending the past hour or so with us. I'll stop sharing and I see that there are some comments or questions. So maybe Adi, you will ask me. Sure, um, actually there are a lot of questions. Please. So let me just uh, start from what I have from the beginning. Uh, where in Israel is the Libyan synagogue? Is it The in... Tunisian synagogue is in Akko, Acre in the northwestern part of the country, half an hour north of Haifa. And a Libyan synagogue as well? Oh, the Libyan, we have quite a few. One of them is in the Moshav in the south. And the nice one is in Netanya. Netanya is home, as I mentioned, to many, many uh, uh, Libyan Jews. Great, thank you. Um, so they asked also who workshop there. Pardon? Just just who workshop in, in the synagogue, only Libyan Jews? Uh, mostly. This is, you know, like in many places, it's a disappearing. So the guy is Libyan and his father was Libyan and his grandfather, but he married either a Moroccan lady or a Romanian one or a Russian born one. So what will happen in the next generation? I don't know. So uh, right now we still have like a hard core of the people, the Yemenites pray with the Yemenites, the Turkish Jews, the Kurdish Jews, the Persian Jews, and so do the Moroccan Jews and so on. But to tell you that I'm sure that it will be the same way in a couple, in a few years, I don't know, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Um, does barbary come from the word Berber? Uh, I believe it's a corruption because it's Barbary coast and the people are Berbers. I don't know if it's a corruption of the word or an insinuation, I'm not sure, but both of them are from North Africa. Okay, great. Um, are people in, those, in these countries are Sunni or Shi Muslim? Sunni, 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 with the exception of Libya, which has a large, I didn't go into details. You can imagine we could talk hours about each of these countries. But since you asked, I will mention it. There is another uh, kind of school in Islam called Ibadi. You know, you know the people who are Ibadi. If you know the Sultanate of Oman on the Persian Gulf, they are Ibadi. It's a unique form of Islam. They are not Sunnis and not Shiites. Actually, they oppose them in many ways. For example, just to suggest, they don't believe that the Quran came down from heaven. They believe the Quran was written by a person and so on and so on. They accept some of the caliphs of the Sunnis and some of the caliphs of the Shiites. They don't believe in succession in the certain way, but otherwise everybody is Sunni all the way from Egypt to Morocco and the rest of the African countries, which are Muslims. You only find Shiite in Iran, in Lebanon, and very small minorities in other countries spread all over from Malaysia, Indonesia, and so on. But most of the Muslim world, over 80% is Sunni Muslim. Okay, thank you. Um, how did the Jews of Libya get along with the others in the country? Um, particularly after the country became Muslim? So there were different periods and the story was very different. I'm gonna send you, as I always do, lots of information and Adi, you will forward it please to the people, for people who wanna read in depth about the story of the Jewish communities in these countries. So usually things were quite good for them. In Libya, even better than Tunisia, but, Unfortunately, there were riots, for example, Tunisia. Uh, just a few years ago, there was, a, there was a terror attack by a policeman guarding the synagogue in Jerba, 
Can you imagine? Uh, he started shooting and he killed 18 people. 14 of them were German tourists. But, and we're talking only less than 12 years ago and so on. So, you know, things happen all the time. When the Palestinians were there, Israel uh, went after one Palestinian leader and we got him over there. And that brought lots of unrest. For a while, Israelis were able, in the 1990s, we were able to travel to Tunisia. And then after, the, after these uh, things erupted in uh, Tunisia, we cannot travel there with an Israeli passport for the longest time. And now they make special dispensations, special arrangements to visit, especially on the high holidays where Tunisian born Jews would like to go back to their, you know, to the roots and participate in the big Hilula, in the big festivities. So actually a lot of people ask if it's um, safe for Jews to travel to Tunisia or any other, Tunisia or Libya, they ask a lot. Libya, I don't know, to be honest with you, it's very tense, especially following the Arab Spring. Uh, they have cleaned up their act, they are stabilizing the government, but they have a whole bag of issues to deal with from the Gaddafi time. And they were under very strict dictatorship. So the whole concept of human liberties and freedom of speech and, you know, uh, privileges, civil, civil privileges and so on is like very new to the young generation, especially they are catching up. But I would wait a couple of years before I go to Libya, but Tunisia, by all means, Malta, tomorrow. <laughs> Great. Um, what language do the Jews of Tunisia speak on a daily basis? Oh, they speak the local Arabic dialect of Tunisia, which is a mixture of the Berber language and Arabic. And they were all perfectly versed in Hebrew, not necessarily versed for a daily speech, but to read the text and understand it, all of them, all of them. Great. And are there two Tripolis, one in Lebanon and another in Libya? Right, right. Tripoli comes from three police, three cities. Like Cartago comes from the Hebrew, Keret Hadeta. The Phoenicians spoke a Semitic language, a Semite language which is close to Hebrew and Aramaic. And whenever they set up shop, they called it Keret Kiria, you know Kiria, la Kiriat Ata, Kiriat Arba, which means a town, Chadeta, Chadesha, new town, which the Greeks immediately translated into Neapolis. And you know very well a town which the Italians changed to Napoli. So Napoli comes from Neapolis, a new town, which comes from the Phoenician. And when there were few towns connected, it was called Tripoli. So we really have one in Libya and one in Lebanon. Absolutely. Um, what drove the people to convert to Judaism? Uh, the, that is before Christianity got there. And it's before Islam. And there were some Berber tribes which had syncretism in their religion. They had animistic belief and they had all kinds of pagan traditions, but they were very much into spirituality. So exposed to the Jews, many of them were fascinated with the spirituality of the Jews and they took it upon themselves. And at that time, Jews did not make you go through a rabbinical court to convert, you know, orthodoxy. You accepted Jewish uh, rights, you accepted Jewish concept, you would obey the Shabbat, you'll keep dietary laws, welcome into our crowd. Look, the, one of the most significant people in our history, King David, his uh, great-grandmother, she was, she was not uh, Jewish, right, Ruth? And she just says to her mother-in-law, your nation is my nation, your God is my God, wherever you go, I go. And that's how she became Jewish and she became the, 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 the uh, great grandmother of one of the most significant people in our history. So at, at certain points, Jews, uh, people could convert to Judaism much easier and they, they did it because they were fascinated by what they saw. 
By the way, the first Jew to set, to set foot in many of the islands, in Malta and other islands, was actually Paul. Saint Paul, <laughs> he was actually uh, a Jew by the name of Shaul, Shaul Hatarsi, the creator of this amazing religion we know Christianity, much more than Jesus, is Paul. And he's the first Jew, as a Jew, who... <laughs> to arrive with the gospel, with the good news to these islands. Thank you. We do have a bunch of more questions. I'm going to take three more and then we'll, we'll end it um, to also respect Jacob's time and everybody's time. So uh, next question is, uh, is Zionism still important to North African Jews? Is Zionism still important? Yes. So you realize 200 Jews in Malta, 2,000 in Tunisia, none in Libya, 1,000 to 8,000, depending on the day of the calendar in Morocco, I would say yes. Overwhelming majority of the Jews from these countries left, and the others are in constant touch with Israel, part of the uh, World Jewish Congress, and so on and so on. Absolutely. Is there anti-Semitism in Malta today? Not at all, not at all. Tunisia, back and forth, used to be until I mentioned some years ago. But after the Palestinians left, uh, it became a non-issue, the whole story of Palestine. Every now and then you might see a walk, a demonstration during the Arab Spring. Uh, there were some uh, exclamations, but not really, not really. The Jews who live there feel perfectly fine and protected and comfortable. And many mentions about the, the colors and the blue and white and the colorful black balconies. Um, does the color have like some meaning? Some? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The garment of the high priest, which is duplicated in your talit. And those of you who wear the tzitzit was made of white linen with the fringes. One of the fringes was very pale blue. Why? At that time, they didn't have the clock or the watch. They didn't know what time it is. How did they know that it's time to pray? The high priest, early dawn, would lift up the fringes of his garment. And the moment you can see the pale blue tell the difference from the white, you knew it was dawn, he would signal, and then uh, the priest will blow the trumpets and the lyre would play and so on and so on. Blue and white is an ancient tradition 3,000 years ago, and that was a symbol of Judaics. That was something you held on to to show that you were a Jew by the garment. Absolutely. Wonderful. Uh, a lot of people did ask if you can send us the video that you mentioned for us to, to watch. Yes, yes, yes. It will be sent to you. Yes, absolutely. Okay, perfect. So um, everybody, I'm going to send you all an email later today with everything that Jacob uh, will, will send me and you'll, you will, you'll be able to see everything. So thank you so much, Jacob. It was extremely interesting to see and virtually visit places that I would probably never be going and visiting. And I also want to thank everybody else for joining us today. Um, and every week on, on Tuesday, we deeply appreciate your support and donations. And actually, we'll see you again, not next week, but in two weeks. As for next week, we are have the honor to all the hosts uh, semi segment and mot motivational speaker and Holocaust survivor in town for a whole week. So we're gonna go with him to in the communities to 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 speak in person. So next week we're not gonna see each other, but I'll see you all in two weeks. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you, and I like to thank everybody who's been writing to me. Thank you for your kind words. <laughs> I'm flattered, and looking forward to seeing you again. Shalom, everybody. Bye bye. Bye-bye.